you have cancer. Three words that change a life forever. We would like to offer another three words. Be an overcomer. Welcome to the 1% Podcast, where our conversations with other cancer warriors, survivors, and caregivers allows us to give you that extra boost you need to face your challenge head on, live life from a new perspective, and forge a path that keeps you moving free and clear. Now, welcome your host and cancer survivor, Truett Taylor. Welcome everyone to today's episode of the 1% Podcast, the show where we dig deep with cancer warriors, survivors, and caregivers in order to give you the 1% you need to keep pushing forward. Today we have the pleasure of talking with Nick. Nick was 36 years old when he was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer that had progressed to his liver and bladder. He's currently a fraud analyst for a large bank in Jacksonville, Florida. Nick, how's it going today? It's going pretty good. Awesome, man. I'm looking forward to chatting with you today. I know we had talked previously um, about your story a little bit, and I think it's very unique. Um, you know the way that you found out you had cancer, and then you know just your current lifestyle now being you know a cancer warrior, still going through treatment. I think that's something that a lot of people will enjoy hearing. Why do you think it's important for you to be able to share your story today with all of our listeners? Well, I uh, I think you know a lot of people might just think you know, that they're dealing with this alone. So I, I think getting, getting the story out, you know, even though my mine might not be the same as anybody else, but it, I think it might, should help other people. Maybe uh, they might be able to relate to it by some of the things that I've gone through. Maybe they're going through the same thing and, and definitely, hopefully, you know, they can um, figure out, you know, know there's, there's other people out there that are, that are going through their same type of situation and, and hopefully, you know, be a positive spin on it, you know, that, that you can definitely get through it. Absolutely, man. Is there like one thing in particular that you hope people take away from your story today? Uh, hopefully, you know, that this isn't, you know, this isn't the end, end all be all, you know, there's still a lot of life to live and uh, you definitely got to enjoy it, you know, as best you can and, and just really cherish all the memories and experiences. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Lots of times when we hear the word cancer, our first thought is death, right? And that's one of those things where, I mean, that's kind of what we're taught because we, you know, again, we all think of, you know, the people that we've seen that have gotten cancer that have just that have died and everything else. And that's your immediate fear. And I think a lot of times in our life, especially us, you know, younger people, when we, you know, we don't expect to, to have to think about death until we're older, but um, having this diagnosis makes us realize that a lot sooner and so i think that's definitely like a huge adjustment in life so just to get started with our questions today the first thing i want to ask you is can you tell us a little bit about your life prior to your diagnosis yeah you know i you know i was trying trying to you know be somewhat responsible you know having the doing the adult thing of having a normal Monday through Friday job and then trying just to live life, you know, trying to go out there and meet interesting people, hang out with friends. Um, but you know, no, nothing, nothing crazy, nothing out of the norm. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, go to the bar and have a few too many beers at times, but other than that, you know, just, just, I, I consider myself just pretty much like a, a regular guy like anybody else. Can you tell us about, the days or the hours for your situation that led up to you finding out that you had cancer? Yeah. For, for me, I, um, it was the night before I was about to fly from uh, Jacksonville to Michigan and, um, I was having a hard time falling asleep. I, I was breaking out in a cold sweat and basically I ended up finding this, this large mass or I, I felt this large mass underneath my belly button and um, after, after, you know, kind of lying there for a while, I finally decided to get up and, and go, go to the ER. I, I, I basically, I thought I, uh, I had my appendix pop on me and even the ER doctor, when I went in there also was kind of thinking the same thing. And then they did the scan. And the next thing I know, I mean, this was, they did the scan around three, three, three thirty in the morning. And then by like five o'clock I was, I was admitted put in a room 
And I didn't really see a doctor for a couple hours until, you know, until the doc, until the day shift doctors came in and they finally came and, and started explaining to me the fact that one, I had this, this massive tumor that they had to do immediate surgery on. And then two, that they were going to test it. So, and they, they, they were thinking that, you know, there's possibility that there was, there was, you know, cancer there. But, um, so basically, you know, I, I'm there all alone and very, very uneasy. Cause you know, uh, not a lot of people get, I don't, I don't know if a lot of people get, you know, admitted from the ER and stay overnight, but overnight when you're there in the middle of the night, there's a lot of people just, just wailing and, and, and screaming in pain. And that, that was tough. I didn't sleep probably for the next couple of days um, until, you know, and then once I finally did have the surgery, they did the test, they came back, they let me know what it was. And, you know, I, I honestly was, was pretty shocked. Didn't really know how to comprehend everything for the first few days. I was very, very happy that my parents were there, that they were able to ask more questions than I did because I, I, you know, you, you get the news, but it, it took a few days for it to really sink in. So you had some pain, you went to the ER, you stayed overnight, they came in and diagnosed you. Did you have the surgery? Did you stay in the hospital and have the surgery like immediately right after that and never went home? Let's see, I was there Wednesday and I, I didn't get admitted or I didn't get released for about uh, 10 days. I think that was the total. So it was the following, following week and I finally got released. So basically, uh, once, once they realized what they had to do, um, they did the prep where I, I had to do the uh, no food, basically just a liquid, uh, basically a cleanse for the lack of a better word. So 24 hours of just do, doing the, uh, the stuff to, to kind of clean out the system. And then by Friday morning or Friday afternoon, uh, I was prepped and put in and they did the surgery. And then, um, I mean, they, they, you know, they had already kind of came in and, and had their suspicions and all that. And they, they kind of let me know, but it wasn't, wasn't until after the surgery that they, you know, they, they got more of the test back to really let me know exactly what was going on, what everything was. And again, it, it, you know, I was, you know, on a lot of different drugs and, you know, just for the pain and whatnot. But uh, it, 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 it took a while for it, again, for it all to really to sink in. And, you know, basically, you know, you're incapacitated after you have that type of surgery. I, you know, I, I woke up, no idea that they were going to um, uh, basically, you know, I ended up with a colostomy where they, you know, they had to, you know, put that in the front and didn't really comprehend that for the first couple of days, you know, have, having a catheter and again, just all these things. And I'm just trying to understand why, and, you know, it really took a few days for it to really start sinking in that, that I was really that sick. And, uh, and you know, the, the, they're, they're explaining it to me and they kept asking, if you have any questions, but it, it was, you know, I, I just, I, I remember sitting there just kind of looking at them with, just a, a dumbfounded look on my face, I'm sure. But again, I was very happy that, you know, my parents and, and I did also have some friends that came and visited. Uh, but it, it was very, very good to have, you know, my, my BD family there, that they were able to ask the questions. So later then I was able to better understand and comprehend. And then I was able to ask the questions to the doctors later. So what a it, huge, it yeah, what a huge change of events. You know, you were thinking you all of a sudden went to the ER and next thing you know, 10 days later, You've had all this happen and just listening to you talk, it sounds like, you know, even to this day, it's still kind of hard to imagine, you know, you, you, you go in with abdominal pain and then, you know, several days later you have surgery and you have a colostomy. And I know that's, that's a huge, you know, I would say it's a huge mental blow in a lot of ways. When you look down, all of a sudden things are, are wired a little bit differently than they were before. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that that experience alone that that's that is mind changing uh and, and i mean unless you have it i mean it, it's really hard to explain to to anybody else that of exactly you know how that feels and how that works and really you know it's it's it is it, it's it's definitely a life altering can you explain to our listeners i'm sure there's a lot of listeners out now that remember or either are 
either going into a surgery that they're going to have to, they've been told they could possibly have a colostomy or they currently have one. Can you give them some words of advice? I know it's, it, again, it's a tough subject, but can you, you know, again, you went through it and you didn't even know that you were going to wake up with it, but can you give them a little bit of courage or words of advice when it comes down to having to, you know, experience something like that? Well, I mean, go, going through it, I mean, especially once, you know, af, more or less after the hospital, when you're, when you're kind of on your own or, you know, you're out in public, dealing with it is definitely, you know, you're, you're very cautious the places you go. You kind of want to be closer to bathrooms. Um, honestly, you know, you, you got you to gotta make sure you definitely change up things that you're eating. If, you know, if, if you ate, you know, say spicy food, you know, gave, gave you a, problems right away I would I would recommend avoiding spicy food uh, anything that you know maybe just kind of didn't settle well with you I, I would always recommend you know I would try to stay away uh, you got to keep that area clean um, the other thing is it's not like it's not like you're able to really you know control what's going on so you just it, it, it is hard but you kind of have to accept that hey you're, you're going to be making some unusual noises at times that that you, you really can't explain so uh, it might be embarrassing, but you know, it it it's not it's not the worst thing. It you know, if, if you happen to make a noise and it's a really quiet situation, it it's it's just part of life. So you, the way I look at it, hey, if you can't if you can deal with uh, you know, passing gas and and, and that that type of humor, I I kind of use that. You know, I I had no problem with that type of humor. I I thought you know I've always enjoyed that. So that that to me kind of made it a little bit easier and and hopefully if that is something you have to go through you know i i you just got to look at it somewhat as, as positive as you can and and hopefully you know maybe it'll make it put a smile on your face at times but it it is a very uncomfortable situation and it's, it's not something that i i would hope on anybody but yeah unfortunately it is part of it where where some people do have to have to go through that ordeal I think a lot of people look to you once because it's, you know, if it's you that's having to go through it and you that's experiencing that, they look and see how you respond. And lots of times that gives them permission to respond a certain way. So if you're like, oh, yeah, it was me and you laugh it off and that probably makes people feel a little more comfortable, even though it, it doesn't really matter what anyone else thinks when it comes down to that. But like, you know, they think people look to you for responsibility on how to react to a certain situation, whether it's you know, the colostomy, whether it's you having cancer, whether it's um, anything else that you have going on in your life, people tend to mimic your response. Um, if you're okay with it, it tends to make people okay with it as well too. So, you know, after you just, you know, have all this stuff done and everything else, tell us a little bit about your treatment schedule. So you, you've got the colostomy, like what, what kind of treatment plan do they put forward um, after you got out of the hospital? Well, let's see, we had to wait like about six weeks after, after the surgery, more or less just to kind of let all the, the, um, the, uh, incisions and, and the, the wounds to heal. Um, then, then it was basically a, a two days every other week type treatment plan where, um, I was getting multiple chemotherapy, uh, uh, medicine. And, and I actually got a, um, a port put into me, you know, the, a, a day or two after I had the, uh, the the tumor removed, they decided to put a port in my chest as well, which basically, you know, that way they can, they can put, you know, put the uh, medicine right in there. It's a lot easier than having to go through the veins of the arms all the time. Uh, so basically it, I'd go in on it like a uh, Wednesday and I'd be there probably for about six to seven hours uh, get, getting medicine. And then I would leave getting a, with, with a, a little machine that, uh, was, was, you know, I was still, I would be getting medicine for 46 hours with this little machine, which, um, that, that is really, it's, it's, it's pretty uncomfortable because basically, you know, you got to try to figure out it, it's like a little fanny pack type thing or, or even a purse, but you got to try to figure out how to, uh, maneuver that, especially when you're trying to sleep. So a lot of times I just wore it as a fanny pack. I, I would just, you know, sit in a recliner and sleep in a recliner most of the time. And then I go back on, on, on the, the, after 46 hours, I go back in, they would take that out and I would get another two or three medicines 
Uh, and I was getting a lot right at, right at the beginning. And, um, and actually it was about, I think it was finally, you know, nine months of, get, of getting the same regiment and it showed really positive responses. Everything, you know, um, was, was getting smaller right away. Uh, it, it had such a good response that, um, nine months after having, I was able to have the, uh, the colostomy reversed. So I was able to get that surgery and, you know, I was finally able to, uh, use the restroom properly, which, which was huge in my mind. But, uh, but yeah, the, yeah, the treatment, you know, uh, a lot of times, you know, you, you just got to try to keep, keep yourself entertained in there. I, I know my, my treatment center that I go to, it's, uh, you know, they have four recliners in there. So there's a lot of times it's, it's, it's a full house where you'll see other patients getting, getting treatment for whatever, whatever they're going through. But, um, yeah, mine was, mine's about, you know, two times or, or two days every other week. And it's actually my same regiment currently. What drugs are you, are they giving you right now? Uh, right now, let's see. Uh, I get Herbitux. I get, actually get that every Friday. Um, I get that, and I think they also do magnesium. And then um, uh, the uh, the five FU is the one that I, I take home and, and get. Uh, that that's through the uh, the, the port machine. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on some of the other names. Unfortunately, they're really a lot of times they're long, and and I, I they they've stopped medicines, they've started different ones. And I am drawing a blank on, on the two that I get on Wednesdays. Uh, I, you can get that I, chemo brain pass on this one, okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, 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 would, I would love to recall right off the top of my head. But, but again, it's, you know, you get all these different ones. And the one that, that I don't like right now, it's, it's, it's the Herbitox just because it makes you sensitive or it makes me sensitive to the sun. So mm-hmm. that's, that, that one I remembered So because that, that one I, I do a lot of research on to try to figure out different ways to uh, – steer off some of the side effects. Gotcha. So What does your regimen look like now? My regimen is, um, I go every Friday. I, I, I get the, the Herbitex is, is, I get that every Friday. But every other week, I'll go in on a Wednesday uh, and get, get, a, get about five hours worth of uh, medicine. And then I leave with the, uh, the, the five FU and that machine. And then I go back in on the Friday. So basically, you know, it's... Um, uh, Wednesday, Friday, one week, the following week could just be Friday and then the Wednesday, Friday, and then so on and so forth like that. Gotcha. So as you're going through chemo and you're working a full-time job, I'm sure along the way people have said some things to you, whether it's good advice, bad advice, or just overall, you know, trying to console you in some ways. What's the, the best and worst advice you've gotten so far? Uh, probably the best advice was somebody, somebody I didn't even know, uh, they were calling, uh, in regards to, um, like, you know, getting, getting me some, some medicine, like they were sending it out or it was somebody through my insurance and we ended up talking for like, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And throughout our conversation, she was like, I, I, I'm so impressed of my attitude, like during the call. And she's like, Hey, if you're going to continue, you know, with such a good positive attitude, you're, you're going to, you know, get through this with no problems. And, and for me that, you know, that, that was something I needed to hear, especially from somebody you, you don't even know saying, Hey, you know, I always consider myself having a pretty good attitude. And, and I, I like to think that, 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 that definitely helps. But hearing that was, was really, really great. But um, probably, probably some, some of the worst is, is, is just the people that it's not so much advice. It's, it's the fact that they come up and go, you know, my, uh, like they would say, like my mother had cancer. 
she's not, she died. It's like, thanks. You know, I, I appreciate that positive, you know, story you just told me. You just, yay. You know, it, there's a lot of people that just, like, like you were saying earlier, they hear the word cancer and it, and it becomes very much a negative thing or they just tell you the worst possible things about something that they, they didn't even go through. It's usually somebody they knew through a friend or, you know, maybe one of their relatives. And, and, and it is unfortunate that some people do have bad experiences from it, but you know, I, I try to, you know, I just shake my head and I'll, I'll smile and nod and, and just kind of let it just kind of, you know, in one ear and out, out the other a lot of times. But it, it, it is one of those things where, you know, it, it is a lot of people do want to try to say something to you. Sometimes they, they don't know what to say, which is fine. Uh, but, you know, you, you do get a lot of different type type of advice, some good, some bad. But it, it's, it's definitely it's definitely better when uh, you can talk to somebody that ha- has gone through that, that experience or, or really was close with somebody that went through the experience. Is there something you recommend people to say to people who have cancer? You know, to, to me, the, the best thing that anybody says, and, 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 you know, a lot of times you don't take them up on it, but it's like, hey, you know, I, 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 a lot of, if they say, I, I couldn't imagine what you're going through. If you ever need to talk, you know, I'm always here. And to me, that would be the best thing because they're not really, they're not trying to put themselves in their shoes or in your shoes. Cause you know, they, they set it up front. They're like, they have no idea what you're going through, but you know, they're also willing to say, Hey, if you, if you need to, you know, either vent or, or just talk about it, that they're willing to listen. And I, I think that that would be the best thing for, for anybody to say, cause you know, it shows that, you know, that, that you're, that the other person's willing to, you know, take the time, listen, and who knows, they might, they might not be able to give you any type of advice, but at least, you know, sometimes just listening is just a, a, a huge, because you know things do build up, and and uh, it, it's it's very nice to have a release. Yeah, and and I'm not going to speak for all men because we're all different. But I think, especially being male, sometimes you know, even for me, like I didn't want to go to a support group or anything along those lines. I just, but I needed to talk to people, and I wasn't doing it. And I think lots of times, you know that builds up in us. And like you said, you just need to, to release and get that out. So that's one good thing that when people come up to you and they talk to you, sometimes just knowing that you're not alone because you know, we're the ones suffering. We're the ones getting sick and going through all the treatment and everything. But you know, someone doesn't have to go right along with that, but just knowing that you're, that you're not alone and you can have like a, a quiet moment or, you know, sometimes people don't have to say anything. They just have to be there with you in the same room. And that that's comforting enough where, you know, Hey, I'm just, I'm not staring at these four walls by myself. I actually have someone here. I think that definitely changes your attitude and gives you a positive way to go through all the treatments and, and cope with what all is going on. Right. Right. I, I, I couldn't agree. hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. And even, you know, for me, like a lot of times I'll, I'll uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going through the treatments during the week where a lot of people are working, but you know, I have, I have a few friends that will, they'll know I'll be going through and they'll send texts or they'll send, you know, some, maybe some funny story or something like that where, you know, it's like, Hey, I know you're going through this, but here either, either we can kind of chat maybe via the text or they're able to call, maybe talk on the phone for a few minutes. And it doesn't have to be about, you know, anything that I'm going through. It could be, you know, really about anything. Just, it's just nice to have, you know, like, like you said, it's nice to, Nice, nice to be able to kind of communicate with somebody, even even while you're going through it. You know, sometimes it just, just helps maybe t- even take your mind off of, of what's going on. Absolutely. You brought up something earlier that um, I wanted to bring back up, and you said that you were speaking to someone on the phone um, about um, medicine or something along those lines, and they told you that they were impressed by your attitude. And I always feel like attitude's a choice. So things can be going really crappy or really great but your attitude is, is something you choose to have. It's the way you choose to handle each situation in life. So you can go into a terrible situation with a terrible attitude or a terrible situation with a great attitude. It doesn't necessarily change the outcome, but it changes how you deal with the process. And, you know, just having to live, you know, every day for the past several years, you know, 
week with weekly treatments, you know, a different change in your lifestyle and stuff. I really want you to share with us today, like how, you know, what choice did you make? Because I'm sure like everybody else, you were freaked out, you were numb, you didn't know what to do, you thought you were gonna die, you Googled how many times you were gonna die every night until you decided that every website says something different. Like, so what, at what point did you say, hey, you know what, I'm not gonna be a victim of this circumstance, but I'm actually gonna overcome this, and whether it's with my attitude or just the things that I'm doing, like what was that moment, or what was maybe a collection of moments that you've had that have given you this positive attitude as you go through and fight this every day? Well, one of them was actually when I was in the hospital, because uh, one of the things they were, you know, you have you had the surgery and you, you're kind of in, incapacitated for a few days, and I was bound and determined to get up and start walking around, and you know, I I would, you know, I was pushing myself, and you know, the nurses would come in, the the um, the, the therapist would come in. And they, they would say, hey, are you sure you want to do this? And, and not only would, would I walk, I'd, I'd try to walk even further than they would want me to walk. So I was definitely determined, one, I wanted to get out of the hospital and kind of get uh, get into, get out of that gown and actually put on some of my own clothes. That, that was a motivation. But And then also, you know, I, I've, I've always kind of had a pretty good attitude, you know, just as a way of life. And like you said, you know, you, you kind of look stuff up, you, you kind of get, you kind of be, you're kind of told at times, Hey, uh, your time is your, your clock is ticking. Well, that's unfortunate. That's true of everybody. So I, I just, I try to look at it more like, Hey, you know, it's time to, to enjoy, enjoy many experiences. You're going to have to go through this. There are going to be days that are not as good. You, you know, you're going to struggle some days, but, uh, if, you just got to try to try to look at any and all positives, you know, the best you can. I, you know, I, you know, getting out there with friends, just laughing it, again, you, you don't have to be talking about your situation. Just, I think, you know, sometimes even when you, you know, even when I feel down, I'll go out, hang out with some friends, just kind of listen to them, talk about, uh, talk about, or even complain about their job. And a lot of times that's when they, they look at you and go, I don't know why I'm complaining to you. But I, honestly, that makes me it's just kind of all of a sudden for a few moments, you're, you kind of forget the fact of anything that you're going through and you're, you know, you just kind of get back into what the, the way it was. And, you know, for me that, 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 that's nice. I mean, I, I know what I'm going through and I, I definitely have no, no reservations of, a of giving up any type of fight at this time. But uh, yeah, it, it, I, I just try to look at everything, you know, with, with, a, with some type of positive spin. Have you ever had any points where you just want to completely give up? I will say yes. Um, in uh, 2016, my mom got diagnosed and she lasted three months. And that killed me. <clears throat> but but it also made me want to fight even harder. What was it about that situation that made you want to fight harder? It was really um something more that my parents always kind of I, I don't know at what point they said this to me, but they were like, "Hey, you know, parents shouldn't bury their children. Children should be, you know." burying their parents for, for whatever reason that that's, you know, something that's always kind of stuck with me. So I've always uh, definitely tried to try to keep that as a, as a, in the back of my head as a, as a little bit of a motivate motivation to myself, you know, definitely want to, would love to, you know, make it as long as they have or had. And then, um, you know, experience as much as I can. So the, that little, you know, that, I don't, again, I don't know when they said that to me or how that came about, but that is just something that's always kind of stuck with me in the back of my head. And that that's definitely been part of my motivation. Yeah. And I know this is a subject that's, you know, obviously hard to talk about, but I think that, you know, sometimes when people go through certain situations, like you think it's bad enough and then something else happens. Right. And exactly. this is a, a situation that obviously you guys weren't, 
prepared for either, but it happened. But, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I've had similar situations happen to me. Unfortunately, I lost, I lost a brother um, unexpectedly, uh, you know, right before, um, a couple of years before I went through all of this as well. And it's, it's not something that you ever get over. It's something that you, I say, learn to live with every day. Right. And um, losing a family member, losing someone close to you, it, it, it always opens up like a, a wound that you can, that you can only put a bandaid over. I would say there's nothing that's ever going to heal that wound, but you know, something that your, your quote that they, you know, that one of your parents had told you about, you know, not burying a child, you know, before you bury a parent kind of thing, like the very, th- the very fact that that's something that internally motivates you to keep fighting every single day, I think is, it's huge because those moments where you do want to quit and you do want to give up, you know, everybody has a tape recorder in their head and there's certain things playing on that tape recorder that get us through moments. And I think that that's one of those things where you probably got that on repeat when it comes down to going through difficult moments in your life and moments where you struggle and moments where, you know what, you're like, screw this. I don't want to fight anymore. And that kind of internal motivation. And, you know, I think that's a, that's a priceless moment, but I feel like those are moments that, you know, the circumstances are unfortunate with with the way it happened, but, but, you know, God gave you something from them to keep pushing you through the moments where you didn't want to, you didn't want to continue on. And I think that's a huge gift that you have and something that, you know, will continue to carry you forward as you, as you push through your life. And because, you know, cancer doesn't affect just one person. It affects everybody that loves you and all the people that are around you and everything probably see you as a huge motivation. And even like you said earlier, when people are complaining about their jobs, like, like, wait a minute, you know, Nick's over here and he's got a lot more that he's experienced and he's currently experiencing. So you're putting people's life in perspective without even knowing that. And, you know, you're carrying with you, you know, some words that of wisdom and some motivation, you know, from your parents that are kind of keep pushing you along. So I think that that's a a super real moment. And again, as I know, it's a difficult moment to talk about and share, but those are the moments that we all need to realize as just a collection of people that we're not in this alone. There are people that are going through this, and there are people who have had unfortunate things continue to happen while they have cancer and life still moves forward, but it moves forward completely different. And you're, you're choosing every day to have a positive attitude. And I know it's hard, man. Trust me. I know that you have, you're like enough's enough kind of moments and stuff, but the very fact that you have strength to continue to go through this, because, you know, as of, as of today, you know, your story is not over yet with cancer. You still continue to fight. You're a warrior, man. You have to continue to fight through that. And, you you know, we're praying that one day you'll have the moment where it's all said and done and everything, you know, you can look back on this whole situation and stuff. But, you know, I think people that continue to go through it just like you're doing are some of the strongest people and some of the most motivational people and, you know, people that are responsible for continuing to shine light on what it's really like to live with this disease and to progress through it in a positive way. So I think you're awesome, man. Just, just again, go in there and sharing that and sharing your story. So it's amazing. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's going to be tough. My dad is pretty healthy for 71. So I think he's going to be on, he's going to be going for a while. So I'll have to try to keep up. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. So just as your life. So I feel like there's like a pre-cancer you and there's like a post-cancer you because your whole perception perception changes in life. Um, can you tell everybody how you've adjusted to your new lifestyle? So you, you know, you constantly have to wear the, um, the port with the, the chemo drip on it and things like that. And how do you work with that? And how do you handle like a normal going out and dating and eating and, you know, all those friendships and stuff like that. How do you handle that? Um, or how have you adjusted to that lifestyle? Um, that you're currently living right now? Uh, you know, you know, I, I still, honestly, 
the, 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 you know, I'm trying not to let, you know, cancer hinder, hinder me going out experience in life, hanging out with friends. Uh, you know, when it comes to eating, you know, I, I do try to eat better, but obviously there's where weekends happen and, you know, pizza gets shoved in your face. So <laughs> I, so I, I definitely try, try to try to be somewhat good, but you know, I, I, I I'm conscious of, you know, I try to be conscious of, of what I'm eating. Um, and you know, but usually when I'm, you know, I, I usually will wear the pork kind of as a fanny pack and, you know, I was happy to see that the advertisements that fanny packs are, are kind of back in. So I, I feel like I'm a trendsetter. There you go. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I don't do a whole lot when I have that, you know, I, I go to work, I, I might go meet some friends, do like trivia or something like that. But, uh, I, I usually when I'm wearing that thing, I, I kind of try to, you know, just kind of be low key. But uh, a lot of times, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying not to let this thing do, do change, change too much of, of my regular day to day, obviously going to work, uh, coming home and, and, you know, and trying to continue to enjoy, enjoy the little things. Awesome. Do you, you know, as far as advice for people, um, can you give people a, a I guess a piece of your advice now or someone listening needs to hear this obviously. So what is like that piece of, and and I'm calling them 1% moments where you've, you've discussed them already, where you've, you fought through this. Like, can you give people a piece of advice on how to, um, I guess cope with their, their lifestyle as they continue to go through cancer treatments? Wow. That's all right. Well, I, I, I would, I would say, say this, you know, you're, you obviously, when you're going through this, you're going for through it for a reason. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're trying to continue, continue living. So they, they might, it might hurt, you know, it, it's, it's going to make you tired. Uh, you, you know, you're going to be exhausted. There's going to be, you know, when you're going through it, it, there's, there's just going to be some, some, you know, you might have some self doubt at times, but you, you got to kind of have to push through and some of the things that I, you know, I've been doing is, is, you know, making, you know, little trying to, trying to set up like either vacations or, or, you know, events, you know, people, people, friends getting married, different little things like, Hey, I, I want to be my healthiest and, and try to try to make it to this day and, and so on and so forth. I mean, obviously these are little minor goals for me, but, and, and there are, there are the larger goals at, in the end, but, you know, it, to me, you just, you gotta, you gotta try to remain as, as positive as you can about it. Uh, you cannot let it get you, get you all the way down. And there, there's a lot of life to still live and there's a lot of experiences out there. You, you just gotta be willing to, to kind of go through it and then, and then try to enjoy all those other things. Yeah. It sounds like you, your advice is to give people something to look forward to, you know, planning a vacation or planning an event or planning a weekend trip or planning something where you actually can look forward to it for a couple of weeks or a couple of days ahead of time to kind of give you something to, to focus on versus just the current situation of the day. Does that sound about right? Exactly. It it helps, you know, gives you some mode, some type of motivation to, to, you know, get to that point to to that, to that vacation or, or, you know, that, that trip in the mountains or whatever, wherever it is or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, Nick, you know, again, your whole story, uh, when we first spoke a couple months ago, I knew that your situation was real unique. And again, you know, cancer survivor stories are awesome. I have one. A lot of people have one, but cancer warrior stories to me, um, really speak volumes about the person that's currently going through it and their, just their overall perception and stuff. So just, you know, from you being diagnosed, you know, at 36, all of a sudden an ER visit where you have, you you find out that you're in the hospital for 10 days and get the stage four colon cancer diagnosis to the situations where you're, you know, with your mom and in the day-to-day treatment and just living a lifestyle you know, just, just going through all of that, man, I think, you know, and you're a rock star, man, for being able to go through that. And more importantly, being able to talk about it as well, too, because I know that's not the easiest thing to do. So 
this podcast is all about you. It's all about highlighting the, you know, the cancer warrior today. And, you know, I think that you're amazing. I think your story will dramatically impact, you know, thousands of people that are listening to this today. And, um, I want to end our interview with a couple of random questions just to kind of give our listeners um, a snapshot more into you. Um, <laughs> can you tell us two things that motivate you? Ah, sure. You know, you know, family and friends. I mean, the, basically, you know, they're the reason to continue on for me. You know, they're the most important people that, you know, most important people to me. So they, they're, they are my main motivational factor. Awesome. Do you have any supplements or products that you recommend um, that have kind of helped you get through? You know, I, I've done a lot of different things. Uh, really to me, like m the multivitamin type uh, uh, pills or, or, you know, like I've been on a, uh, like a, a propel type kick where, you know, I just add the propel stuff into regular water. Uh, that's really been it. You know, I, I've asked my doctor a few times about other things and she says yay or nay. And, but, but really to me, I just, I've been trying to do a lot of like multivitamin type stuff. Yeah. What's the last book you've read? Oh man. It was a, a Tim Dorsey book. Uh, Stingray. Oh my gosh. He's a, he's a, he's a Florida writer where he basically goes around to different uh, little cities within Florida and kind of goes into the back alleys and then writes about, it's really demented. He writes about a, this, this uh, crazy serial killer and then also the detective that's trying to catch him. It's about at least a dozen books or so, but it's, it's pretty entertaining. Awesome. Do you have a favorite recipe or food? I know you said pizza earlier. What do you, what do you usually get on your pizza? Oh, well, it kind of depends. We, we, um, we have this establishment, Mellow Mushroom, and their their house pizza is pretty uh pretty awesome. Basically, you know, it's a little bit of everything. But yeah, I I, I honestly, when it comes to pizza, just put it in front of me. As long as it's, there's no tomatoes, that's that's my only thing. I'm just everything <laughs> else I can eat. What are three items that you have on your bucket or life list that you want to accomplish going forward? Man, I would love to either get to Scotland or or uh, Ireland. Just just a just to get over in that area and kind of, kind of walk around, see some castles, maybe venture around one day full on kilt. Um, I've never been to the West coast either. So I, I kind of want to do, obviously travel would be something huge. Uh, and another one love to make it out to Fenway once just to watch a ball game there. Yeah. I've, I've, I went like about two years ago and it's, probably my favorite stadium to, to definitely watch a game. It's just the history and the stadium, the way it's, it's functions around the stadium is absolutely amazing, man. We have to get you up to Boston one day. Yeah, I would love it. I've, I've done Wrigley. Wrigley was pretty awesome, but I'd, I'd love to love it to make it over to Fenway. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, Nick, again, I appreciate you answering the questions today, um, sharing your story. You're an amazing guy. And, um, I'm actually going to be down in Jacksonville probably in October sometime. So I'll have to, I'll have to link up with you, man, and we'll get a chance to, to meet up and, and just say what's up and, and go from there. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome, man. Well, Nick, we appreciate you being a guest today, and we will be talking with you soon, okay? All right. I definitely appreciate it, Truth. We appreciate you spending time with us on today's episode and encourage you to continue the conversation to help you keep pushing forward. For more resources based on today's episode, as well as ways to recommend a guest and connect to Truett personally, head over to 1percentpodcast.com. Be sure to join us next time for more stories of inspiration right here with Truett Taylor on the 1% Podcast.